So good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin my talk by thanking both the Chair of Digital History at the Humboldt University of Berlin and the Data for History Consortium for organizing this colloquium and giving me the opportunity to share my research. It's quite obvious by the slide, but my presentation will be about the subject of gazetteers. I will provide additional information about the concept of gazetteers in a later part of this talk, but for the moment it's sufficient to know that they're a geographical dictionary containing place information. So within certain fields of digital humanities, so-called digital gazetteers, examples include World Historical Gazetteer and Pleiades, are becoming quite prominent research tools within our field. In this talk, I will go over the development of a digital gazetteer for my own historical research, including the conceptual and technical considerations I dealt with and the features of the gazetteer. So Philippe uh, shortly introduced myself, so I will slightly ignore some parts of this slide, but I would like to give a few ideas about how I started with my PhD research. So during my time as a research collaborator at Ghent CDH, we were developing several projects that could benefit from a database with place information about the city of Ghent. So I began studying the topic and this research eventually led to a PhD opportunity focusing on gazetteers as a subject. So since April 2021, I work on creating an urban gazetteer for historical data, but specifically as a joint PhD student as of now, with Ghent University and the University of Antwerp with my supervisors, uh, Professor Dr. Christophe Verbruggen and Professor Dr. Pirai Hassigudzeller. So with that done, let's transition over to the main structure of this presentation. My talk is divided into five parts and will last around 40, 45 minutes. I will start by briefly introducing the main subject and research questions of my PhD research. During this part, I will make a case for using digital gazetteers as a tool for spatial history and event analysis. In the following part, I give a short introduction on gazetteers, foc focusing on some considerations to take into account when using gazetteers for your own research. After this overview, I explain in the third part how and why I designed my own digital gazetteer. In the fourth part, I demonstrate how I implemented the Gazetteer as a database for linked open geodata, integrating historical place information. In the last part, I will clarify the added benefits of the Gazetteer to some ongoing projects within Ghent CDH, but I also take a critical look at some of the future challenges in the development of the Gazetteer. So this presentation will not start with a section about digital gazetteers, which might seem misleading according to the title of this presentation, but bear with me as I structure it in this way on purpose. Because when doing digital history, I find it very important to clearly state what kind of historical questions I am interested in answering before examining digital tools or methods that could help me in my research. So what I will do in this section is briefly but very briefly contextualize my research by reflecting on the broader field of spatial history and then quickly take a closer look at the research questions of a project I am currently working on and pause at how a gazetteer could help me in answering these research questions. So the working title of my doctoral research is Historical Data Modeling, Developing an Urban Gazetteer for 19th and 20th Century Social Data. During my PhD, I'm collaborating on several projects and these projects have an overlapping goal because they would all benefit from a geographical dictionary that could structure historical data based on places. In other words, the ambition of my PhD research is to create a database of historical places, but then specifically for the Belgian city of Ghent and use those places to locate, organize and analyze historical data in a spatial manner. So this approach can be viewed as being part of a broader field of spatial history. In 2009, 2010, Richard White published a white paper where he characterized spatial history as a collaborative approach on history, focusing on historical space and time and the ways in which space is visualized. Spatial history projects often use computational methods and are often open-ended in the sense that both the project data 
and the tools end up being reused, reworked, and repurposed. So although there's much to say about the field of spatial history, for example, one common critique is the, the excess focus or the excessive focus on mapping. This won't be discussed during the talk itself due to time constraints. But for those who are interested in an accessible discussion on the topic, I would like to refer you to the Future of Spatial History Roundtable, organized by the Digital Humanities Hub of Lancaster University, which can be viewed online. So let's make the, the field of spatial history and my research in specific a bit less abstract by further examining a research project titled Collective Action Belgium, which is a case study that is part of Data KBR BE. So first, the Data KBR BE is an interdisciplinary research collaboration set up to optimize and stimulate sustainable data level access to digitized newspaper collections of the Royal Library of Belgium. So the project Data KBRBE is testing how a relevant corpus of newspaper articles can be extracted from the digitized collections. To develop this, three case studies have been constructed, each with a different focus on the newspaper data. Collective Action Belgium is one of those case studies, and it aims to analyze the protest events as reported in these newspapers. But of course, analyzing the protest events in newspapers has a huge scope, so let's narrow down the research. Collective Action Belgium is a case study of social history, which aims to trace the spatial dynamics of strikes, demonstration, union actions, actions and other forms of collective action as reported in Belgium newspapers during the interbellum period and World War II. So the goal is to develop a method for building a relevant newspaper corpus, mentioning collective actions, by using an article segmentation tool developed within Data KBRBE and keyword searches. Event information that is available in the articles will be semantically coded in order to analyze the collective action data. So who is familiar with modeling historical data is aware of the difficult task in deciding how information should be coded. For example, if there are no casualties mentioned in a newspaper article about a strike, does that mean that there were no victims or were the victims just not reported by the newspaper? This is a matter of coding procedures done by the researcher. Because we want to avoid losing the complexity contained within the data, but during the coding process, we cannot avoid interpretation. So we should always clearly state the way in which we interpret historical information, either descriptive or by coding it into the data. This greatly stimulates the reusability of the data by other researchers. Part of the process for Collective Action Belgium is to code geo information, specifically by linking the collective action events found in the newspapers and the actors who participated in these events with the locations in order to find and analyze large scale spatial patterns of collective action in Belgium. These large-scale spatial patterns can be boiled down to the following research questions, which in turn require some practical solutions. For example, one of the research questions is, if the frequency and scale of actions, is that related to places within the proximity of that action? And do protesters who frequent the same type of places, and do protesters frequent the same type of places throughout time? Or does the type of place that is frequented by protest or other type of events uh, change throughout time? In order to operalize this research questions and the other research questions, a way to locate the different events and place in space-time is required. And if you continue this reasoning for other type of spatial questions, you will most likely conclude that you need a list of all relevant historical places for your research which begins to closely resemble the concept of a gazetteer. So with the previous chapter, I try to make it clear that there are promising perspectives to use the gazetteer in spatial research and to analyze or answer spatial questions. But before going deeper into that line of reasoning, let's first clearly state the features of a gazetteer and how they deal with place, as there are some considerations to take into account here. So as mentioned, gazetteers are geographical dictionaries. 
They are textual documents used to disambiguate places from one another. This is often done by providing geographical information, for example, coordinates, or by providing additional information such as addresses, names, types, or descriptions with the places. Because gazetteers are place dictionaries, they are a useful tool in the humanities to either retrieve or structure geospatial information. A historical, historical example of this is illustrated by the image on the right of the slide because it shows the gazetteer of the city of Ghent in the province of East Flanders. This Wegwezer, as it is called in Dutch, was a yearly published book, although there are multiple gap years, between 1770 and 1916, with information about the city of Ghent, including the location of services and professions in the city. In this way, it makes for a very valuable source for analyzing the urban, economic and social evolution of the city. There's also a common misconception about the importance of maps for navigating in the past. In reality, gazetteers, textual documents, were quite often used as a navigation tool before the discovery of more accurate map projects during the early 16th century. Even after these cartographic practices became well known, gazetteers were still being produced. So there lies an inherent value in the way a gazetteer works. To illustrate this, a gazetteer here was included as an index to a parcel map in, of Ghent. It links place information such as place name and type to the location of the place as it is visible on the map. A digital gazetteer, a database in other words, could help our understanding of space and place in the past by linking these two together. For example, if we would process and store the available information from multiple maps, this would make it possible to systematically systematically compare how and which places are visualized on maps. In the late 20th century and the early 21st century, some steps towards this goal were taken when collaboration of the semantic and spatial domain eventually led to the creation of digital gazetteers. With one of the prime examples is the Alexandria Digital Library Gazetteer. This is one of the earliest examples. These gazetteers came to be known as knowledge organization systems, structuring information based on geographical coordinates and semantic spatial relationships. An example of such a semantic spatial statement would be that my house is located within my municipality. Today, many parts of society rely on large-scale gazetteers or gazetteer-like software such as GeoNames, OpenStreetMap and Google Maps. But despite the functionality of these tools, they are often not used in humanities research because they are not granular or not detailed enough. The issue of granularity has been discussed in depth in the literature. For example, according to historian Peter Boll, what the field of humanities needs are enriched gazetteers that can account for features humanities scholars are most interested in, including temporality, multilinguality and the possibility to extend available knowledge in a cumulative process, which would also require that gazetteers can provide long-term sustainability of information. But here comes the semantic part of the gazetteer. In the meantime, enriched gazetteers such as World Historical Gazetteer and Pleiades are available for the humanities. However, most of these gazetteers still do not have an intra-urban focus. In other words, they do not have a focus on smaller places within a city. Even though some historical data requires a smaller, more detailed focus on place. If so-called urban gazetteers would exist, then historical data such as city directories or census data could become more accessible for research and analysis. But despite the possibilities, there are not many examples of urban gazetteers as of now. One example that can be mentioned is the map of early modern London by the University of Victoria, which opens up the Kivitas Londinum map by annotating the visible places on the map and linking them to mentions in literary documents during the Shakespearean era. Here, the gazetteer is used as an organizing tool for literature, literature sources. So, what is the reason for the lack of urban gazetteers in the humanities? One of the reasons why there might be less urban gazetteers compared to large-scale gazetteers 
is the higher complexity that comes with modeling information at a higher level of detail. Because although both urban and large-scale gazetteers deal with geotemporal properties of places, these properties become increasingly difficult to interpret when working on a smaller scale. Especially questions of place disambiguation, place hierarchy, and typology require further study. To demonstrate this, I will briefly discuss the issue of place disambiguation, as digital gazetteers require a formal definition of place in order to model and aggregate place data. Place disambiguation refers to the topic of place identity. So a database requires stable identifiers as a way to uniquely refer to an object, just as my address is a unique way to refer to my house. In order to assign place identifiers, a place concept needs to be defined using identity criteria. These criteria determine what constitutes a place and if or when a place can change in something different than before. Place identity is abstract. It is determined by the ontological assumptions researchers have when deciding if a place is still the same after an event. In place research, place is often not clearly defined, nor is there a consensus on how to approach a topic. But if you're interested in building a gazetteer for your own research, I would strongly advise you to take time to reflect on these issues. To exemplify this issue, for example, Wagner et al. did a literature review study where they analyzed 58 academic publications on the topic of place. And from these 58 publications, a total of 20 different concepts of place could be derived, which just showcases how diverse the field is thinking about place. In the same study, the place concept that was applied the most frequent was the concept as it is interpreted or mentioned by the human geographer Yifu, Yifu Tuan and related scholars. As this is also the concept of place I currently aim to use for the gazetteer, I would like to explain it a bit in more detail. So, starting from the 1970s, the field of human geography began to make a distinction between space and place. They defined space as a geographical container with no additional features. It was nothing more than a geographical shape, a point, a line, a polygon, that encompasses an area defined by coordinates. It is exemplified by the image on the left of this slide. Place, on the other hand, is space made meaningful. Either through human experiences or place-making activities, space becomes imbued with symbolic meaning, exemplified by the image on the right. Moving through a space is an experience, and we come to know a place by our experiences. So I believe these two terms are central to the idea of a digital gazetteer. The real question is, how should we formalize these two very different concepts in the context of database management? Because in my opinion, when we work with places in our research, we should not view them as independent objects. Rather, we should view place as an organizational practice, a way of structuring information. A place is a perceived conception about a location, and that conception has a certain continuity over time. For example, when I speak about my work building, I have certain expectations about it, such as which rooms I can find where, how these rooms interact with each other, what functions they have, and the location of my own personal work desk. This set of relationships forms my organizational perception I have about the place that I call my work building. As long as there is a continuity in that ID, the place remains the same. So from this viewpoint, place is organized as a set of relationships. And this set has to have components we can model in our database. But just as the concept of place, these components are subjective. To solve this issue, we should look at the common ontological assumptions researchers have about these components of place. For example, Garbage et al. discusses in an article from 2021, how identity criteria of settlements for example, villages, can be defined by the ontological assumptions of historical researchers. The authors of the article conclude that there are four crucial perceived identity criteria for place, namely the proper name of the place, 
the geographical location, the place type, and the elmeriology, which is the part-whole relationship between different places. According to these authors, a place changes its identity if an event causes the place to change its proper name and one of the three other mentioned criteria. So in the ongoing development of the gazetteer, I look to I look to see if this reasoning is applicable to the urban gazetteer. So these were briefly some of the conceptual considerations when working with place. Now it's time to take a closer look at the technical considera considerations when modeling place data. For example, when dealing with placial properties in the context of linked open data, the use of vocabularies and ontologies is necessary to make the data reusable and interoperable. So in the spatial humanities, the linked places format is becoming somewhat of a de facto standard for structuring linked open geodata because it aims to be an interconnection format linking diverse gazetteer datasets. From a technical perspective, the format is designed around JSON-LD, which is a lightweight linked data format. Linked places format uses GeoJSON for encoding the geographic data. You can see this on the right of the slide, but with an additional extension to it called GeoJSON-T, and the T stands obviously for time which allows linked places to add a when element to properties in order to correctly date them. In this manner, the linked places framework accounts for space time, allowing us to uniquely describe a place, even if features of the place change over time. For example, if the location of a place changes over time. However, in the end, I did not adopt the ontology fully while creating the data model for the urban gazetteer, but this has a reason. So what I did is, of what I ended up using, was a model for the urban gazetteer that attempts to align with the general structure of linked places in order to do ease interoperability with other gazetteer dataset, but it is defined using classes from the CDOC conceptual reference model. So CDOC CRM is an upper level ontology for the semantic integration of cultural heritage data. I chose to use CRM as the main ontology for my model because it accounts for classes useful when modeling events, which is necessary for Collective Action Belgium. An extension to CRM, aptly called CRM HEO, introduced the concept of space-time volume, which can be used to document the existence of a place in space and time. A model for a CRM-based gazetteer for medieval and early modern places has been discussed by Schneider et al. The gazetteer model I will present here modifies their reasoning centered around the concept of space-time volume to further align it with the linked places format and the newer version or a newer version of CIDOC CRM. So the model for the gazetteer I built is centered around the class E92 space-time volume and its subclass E93 presence. As mentioned in the previous slide, a place can be defined as an instance of the space-time volume class. Within the ontology, space-time volume has several associated properties and classes that can be used to model the extent of place throughout history. The question is, how does this translate to data as it is derived from historical sources? In the urban gazetteer, place information is based on observations. An observation is an assertion made by a researcher interpreting information about a place as it is available in a historical source. The observation can be modeled as an instance of the class E93 presence. Because E93 presence is a subclass of space-time volume, it can be defined in this context as the spatial extent of a place, but at a fixed point in time. To explain part of this model further, I will demonstrate how to model historical street information in the following slide. So here we have the previously mentioned parcel map from 1855. It mentions the Rue Neuf Saint Pierre, which is the French name for the St. Peter's Nieuwstraat in Ghent. The historical map um, show, shown here on the slide can be defined as the document used to record the place information. The time span, visible on the left of the model, for this observation is determined by dating the historical map. 
because the gazetteer attached to this map also mentions that the place in question is of the type street, we can state in the observation that this place is a street. This is defined using class E55 type. The French name of the street is an instance of linguistic appellation, and if the map is georeferenced, we could even annotate the geometry of the street and add it to the place observation as the spatial extent of the street at this specific moment in time. Important to note is that all place information that is derived from the same source, as, as this is the case here, is part of the same place observation. If another historical source mentions information about the same place, the presence, a new presence is created to model the data. If we have multiple maps, each mentioning place information, for example, about the St. Peter's Nieuwstraat, these historical observations can be linked. Therefore, we first take a look at the identity criteria of the different observations. If these criteria follow the patterns as defined by Garbacz et al., we conclude that the observations refer to the same place. We can then link the observations by declaring them as observations of the same place, or in CEDOC CRM terms, these are all presences that are part of the same space-time volume. This is a full model of the Urban Gazetteer, which contains two additions that were not previously mentioned. The first addition is the adding of the geosparkle mapping. So geosparkle is a standard developed by the Open Geospatial Consortium in order to support querying geospatial data on the semantic web. In other words, mapping the historical data to geosparkle allows users to ask spatial questions to historical data such as which places are contained within a specified area. A second addition is the extra implementation of the class E31 document. These E31 instances document FFF annotations. Briefly explained, FFF is an open standard for exchanging digital objects online. One of the main objects or goals with the, with the Urban Gazetteer is that IIIF sources can be used in the data creation workflow. Such IIIF annotations refer to a specific part of a visual image, in this case a historical source, and it can be used to provide a link between the original source and the digitized data. To give a clear example, which can be viewed on the slide, a georeferenced map that is available in IIIF can have a IIIF annotation outlining the geometry of a building mentioned on that map. As such, that annotation can be stored and it documents the georeferenced location of the place. Include it in the database and you could query the geometries of places you're interested in and immediately or almost immediately get a link to the visual source that showcases the place. I'll have a brief time check, okay? So, which brings us to the next chapter. How do we actually process, store, and analyze information in the Urban Gazetteer? So, for Collective Action Belgium, the Gazetteer should be able to link event data to places within the city of Ghent. I assume this will be the case that it will be predominantly streets, squares, and businesses, as these are often the locations for collective actions. Quite a lot of palatial information concerning Ghent can be found in the Wegwezer. At the moment, 28 volumes of these Wegwezers are digitized and published in IIIF by Ghent University Library. As most of these volumes contain a yearly street index, it is a valuable source for creating an accurate list of historical streets in Ghent. But unfortunately, doing this by hand would be a very time-consuming process. So the question is, if it is possible to extract place information from these indexes in a semi-automatic semi -automatic manner and integrate them with the gazetteer. In other words, how can we go from a textual source, viewed on the left, to structured data in a CSV file that is ready to integrate with the gazetteer? So for the process of integrating these volumes, I've set up an OCR workflow which will be implemented and evaluated in the coming months. 
The workflow begins by importing high quality images from IIIF volumes in an OCR system by choice, of, of choice. If necessary, the images will be pre-processed, pre -pro -pre for example, by splitting, skewing, or binarizing the pages to improve the OCR results. Subsequently, an OCR model will be trained on the processed images. After creating the ground truth data, additional training of the model would, in the end, uh, deliver quality data that can be exported in classical OCR formats such as page XML or Alt Alto XML. Next, the page or Alto XML will be converted to JSON web annotations, which can be linked to the original IIIF manifests. When this is done, the OCR is linked to the IIIF images and enables us to full text search within the document, which could be quite handy for uh, future research. To structure the data into CSV files, another step is taken where the OCR texts are exported and parsed into a CSV file using regular expressions. This is an example of such a page, page of the volume. Luckily, because the way the place information is structured within the volumes is very consistent, regular expressions can be used to parse the text into a CSV file that can later be added into the gazetteer. Unfortunately, that is not um, doable for every source because it depends on the way information is structured, if it is consistent. If this is not the case, it is possible to use a semi-automatic process, but manual correction will need to be done in order to make it into structured data. So while the OCR workflow is being evaluated, the gazetteer itself is being tested using a small corpus of datasets about streets in Ghent. Place information from these CSVs are mapped to the data model and converted to RDF in order to import the data in a triple store. For those who are not familiar with the term, a triple store is a database built specifically for the storage and retrieval of triples. Triples are statements which have a subject predicate object structure. In the case of this talk, an example triple could be that my presentation has subject gazetteers. Once the data is converted to RDF Turtle, which is a syntax for storing triples, the data is uploaded to TripleDB, which is an RDF triple store supporting GeoSparkle. So TripleDB supports GeoSparkle, and GeoSparkle is a query language used for querying geographic data stored as triples. Retrieval of historical data from the gazetteer can be done by writing Sparkle queries. In the example query, I ask to visualize the geometry and place information from a specific source. In this case, this is the information from the previously mentioned parcel map of 1855. Here you can see that we get a visualization of the place geometries together with additional place information, such as the place name and the dating of the historical observation. However, with the Gazetteer, it is also possible to search for data across multiple sources. This next query looks within the Gazetteer for all historical place observations labeled with a specific place type. In this case, that is of the place type road. The results are contained within a table, each mentioning an observation of the type road together with the source that documents that place observation. This kind, of, this kind of query could be very helpful, helpful for researchers interested in specific domains, such as historians interested, interested in cinema history that are looking for places that once had the function of a cinema. At the moment, uh, documents are stored as Zotero URLs, linking back to the metadata of each source in a public Zotero library of the Gazetteer, this might change in the future as there are some issues with storing that information on Zotero uh, instead of the triple store, for example, uh, because it is the, the way it is structured right now, you can't um, query the metadata of the, of the sources themselves. However, modeling bibliographic data is quite difficult, so the cost and benefits of doing it need to be considered. Although there are two extensions for CRM that provide an ontology class 
or ontology classes for modeling bibliographic data, should it, so it should possibly be feasible, but I haven't looked into it um, in detail. So in these last slides, I will briefly mention some early results in using the GSDIR in related project, projects, but mainly focus on the ongoing challenges in the modeling of the data. So, as mentioned, Collective Action Belgium focuses on the modeling of historical collective actions. These are events such as strikes, demonstrations, protests, as reported in historical newspapers. Once a corpus of relevant newspapers articles have been extracted, relevant articles need to be identified using, for example, named entity recognition that can be used to identify key actors in historical events. Within data KBRBE, some tests have already been uh, done, matching information within these articles with Wikidata entries. However, because Wikidata lacks or almost, not almost don't contain any urban places, we would like to use named entity recognition or geographic entity recognition using the Gazetteer as an authoritative list of places. So specifically, Place information that is mentioned in the newspaper's articles needs to be matched with each other, but it can be done with um, available linked open data databases such as Wikidata because we don't have place information contained within those entities. However, if you have a linked open data gazetteer, you could use that as a solution. Another project which could benefit from the Urban Gazetteer is called Gantt Mapped. Mapped is a heritage project focused on developing a geotemporal platform for presenting and sharing digital heritage collections for the city of Ghent. I will show a brief video of the pilot project while I'll talk further about the project. So the main premise of the project is that fragmented and closed off heritage collections could be made more accessible both for researchers and the general public through historical maps. In practice, this will mean that FFF heritage items that mention the same urban places will need to be connected to each other. So what we are currently exploring is if the Urban Gazetteer can be used as a framework to structure and organize the different uh, heritage items, because the Urban Gazetteer contains all the historical places, we just need to find a way to link the historical or the heritage items to places that are relevant to those items. So while the Urban Gazetteer is slowly being implemented, there are still some ongoing challenges that need to be resolved in order to improve the Urban Gazetteer as a tool for spatial research. While the OCR workflow is designed for textual documents, I have yet to implement a workflow for aggregating additional map data. This can, uh, however, be done manually using GIS software such as QGIS and ArcGIS, but it's very time consuming. So two very interesting evolutions uh, regarding or in this in this regard are machines reading maps and the work that is being done on IIIF maps. Machines reading maps is a project steered by the Alan Turing Institute, aiming to create a machine learning pipeline to process text on maps in order to use it as data for research. Another ongoing development is the IIIF maps technical specification group which is working on an extension of the IIIF standard for georeferencing and geotagging IIIF images, which would be quite uh, interesting for the Ghent mapped project, because once uh, IIIF images are geotagged with an, an identifier of a place as it is stored in the gazetteer, it would ease the integration of images on, on spatial visualization. So depending on the evolution of these projects, this could greatly help the data aggregation workflow, either in a semi-automatic uh, way or done by crowdsourcing. For example, the, the crowdsourcing ID is very interesting. Interesting. I would um, mention briefly mention the All Maps project, which is a probably uh, a project you can visit right now and is a crowdsourcing platform for georeferencing and, and annotating IIIF maps. So another issue is that even if we have a large amount of data available, 
that it would still be a very laborious task to reconcile, reconcile the different data sets with each other. So the question in this regard is, is a reconciliation process, can that be partly automated, which is an, an ongoing issue. At the moment, for example, all data available in the Gazetteer uh, are assertions made by me based on the historical sources. However, the historical field frequently deals with different assertions based on the same source. So it should be accounted for in the model that you can have different for different knowledge based on the same source. At the moment, this is not implemented. However, it would seem that the STAR, the Structured Assertion Record, um, a model developed uh, by other researchers, could be easily implemented as it uses compatible CDOC CRM classes to structure the assertions. So these are just a few of the ongoing challenges. Uh, I'm very interested to hear your comments, your remarks, or possible future collaborations. But with this, I, I rest my, my case, my presentation, and I'm open to any new or other questions.